All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your day to uh, listen to me talk a little bit about uh, one of the topics I'm most passionate about, uh, and that is the uh, the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, I work for the National Park Service. It's uh, one of the things that, that I've always loved uh, my entire life uh, has been uh, going to historic sites and actually connecting with history and the places where it happened, like Francis's Tavern. Uh, I would have loved to have given this uh, presentation actually uh, in Francis's Tavern, but hopefully after the uh, coronavirus is over one day, uh, I'll be able to go back up there, uh, which is a great site. Uh, if you've never been, I definitely recommend you check it out to be able to be in the long room there where uh, Washington said farewell to his officers. Um, but I've always been drawn to, to places where American history happened. Um, and, you know, the National Park Service, like I said, usually they preserve, you know, the nation's most significant places. Um, but one of the stories growing up that had always intrigued me was the famous battles of Trenton and Princeton. You know, I'd seen since I was a kid, the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, hearing the story of how on Christmas night, Washington cross the Delaware River and attack the Hessians uh, uh, in Trenton. Um, and it was just a story that really resonated with me. And it wasn't until much later that I went up to go see and actually a reenactment of the Battle of Trenton in Trenton. And it was uh, interesting just how uh, little was preserved. There is no national park there. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's only a, a, a few state parks that, that, that save the place where he crossed the Delaware and the battlefield at Princeton. But in Trenton, there are some plaques, there are some markers. There is a city museum there, the old barracks, that does uh, tell some of that story. But I was just amazed that there wasn't uh, uh, more interpretation of this uh, really important site. Um, so when I had this opportunity, I, I started blogging with this group, Emerging Revolutionary War, as Sarah noted. And if you haven't checked this out, I definitely recommend you check out Emerging Revolutionary War. You can just Google it or check, follow us on Facebook. Um, and uh, you know, I started blogging with them and they have a, a book series. Um, and uh, part of this book series, uh, you know, I said, I would love to be able to uh, tell the story of Trenton and Princeton. Uh, and uh, so la uh, two years ago, I published uh, my book, uh, Victory or Death, uh, The Battles of Trenton and Princeton. If you haven't uh, checked it out, I definitely recommend. It's a short volume, but it gives you a brief overview of the, uh, the actual battles. And it includes a lot of photographs of what the places look like today and uh, historic drawings and as well as maps. Um, and it includes a driving tour. So you can go to the places where this uh, really fascinating history actually happened. Uh, and even though it might not be a national park there, you can still you know, stand there in the city street where so, say James Monroe got wounded and you know it actually happened there. And people will drive over it every day and they don't realize the significant history that happened right there. But I figured, you know, for posterity, be able to write that down, have it in a book, uh, so people can still know where that happened and visit it. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about the, the battles here. I'm gonna share my screen so you all can see a little presentation. Uh, I went ahead and did, so let's share this. Hopefully you all can see uh, my presentation. Hang on. Let me just do that one more time. I just want to make sure I do it correctly. There we go. All right. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Just want to make sure I'm not, all right, very good. Okay, uh, so, you know, this is an image where we, we typically think of, uh, the story of Trenton and Princeton really starts uh, with American independence. Uh, so here's probably one of those famous scenes of, of uh, us uh, declaring our independence, presenting the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia back in July, 1776. Uh, and it's celebrated every year. Ray tends to think of it as this kind of remembers it in this fashion. Of course, a scene like this never actually happened. Uh, you know, the Congress members are going back and forth and there's not one, no one large ceremony like this. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the way we typically remember it. 
And in July 76, things were looking pretty good. Uh, in March of that year, uh, George Washington had driven the British out of Boston uh, and reclaimed that for the Americans. Down in South Carolina, down in uh, Charleston, uh, they had driven back a British invasion force. Uh, so things were looking good. America goes ahead and declares its independence. Now, that's how we typically think of it, but it really wasn't that easy because Great Britain was not about to let her colonies go. And they're gonna come back with a vengeance. Uh, they're gonna come back with about 32,000 troops uh, and sailors that are gonna come to invade New York City, all right, right where Francis's Tavern is. Uh, and these, uh, you know, this is the largest expeditionary force Great Britain had sent anywhere in the world up to that point. Uh, so you're talking about, uh, a, you know, a major expedition that they're going to try and force the American colonies uh, to stay within the British Empire. Um, Head. All right, and uh, so here you can see a uh, colonial map showing you the British coming into uh, uh, New York City. Uh, Washington is going to try and attempt to defend the city uh, from this 32,000 person invasion force with only about 23,000 Americans, okay? But this is going to be the largest army Washington will ever command. Uh, he's going to, and it's almost an impossible task from the get-go, trying to defend all the islands around New York uh, you know, he's gonna have to split up his forces. It's pretty much a, a, a risky situation, but Washington's determined to try and prevent the British from taking, you know, uh, the important city of New York. Uh, the British are gonna land, uh, and among the 32,000 troops are 8,000 Hessians. Uh, now, Hessians are typically, they're from Germany. Uh, they're typically called uh, Hessians, they're called mercenaries. Uh, and they were paid professional soldiers, but they weren't making most of the money. They were paid by the British. Uh, the, the princes were paid by the British Empire um, to send their troops to fight in their war. So, and a lot of these Hessians, you know, they didn't want to be in the war, but they were kind of, uh, you know, drafted or forced into it uh, over in their home countries, and they were sent over here. Uh, but they were very professional soldiers, uh, some of the best uh, in this expedition force that was coming over here. And Washington is going to try and attempt to hold them off. Uh, and he's going to meet disaster after disaster after disaster. Uh, in late August of 18, uh, or late August of 1776, Washington's going to try and attempt to de defend Long Island and Brooklyn, and he's going to meet uh, disaster after disaster. He barely gets his army off of uh, Long Island by crossing right there at the, uh, where the Brooklyn Bridge is today. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, you know, about eight or 9,000 American soldiers were almost captured and destroyed by the British there. And Washington's going, and some of his men, uh, who are actually under the command of Colonel John Glover, who's going to play an important role later in this campaign, he's going to help row these men uh, across the uh, the East River and get over to Manhattan. Um, and they're going to, it's almost like Dunkirk. They're able to to save these eight or 9,000 American troops that are going to be vital, including George Washington, to be vital in the later part of the war. Uh, but they're able to get across the East River to Manhattan and then to Manhattan at Kipps Bay, the Americans basically drop their weapons and run. Uh, Washington at one point rips his hat off, throws it on the ground and says, are these the men I'm to defend America with? Uh, and his aides had to grab his horse's reins and pull him off the field because, you know, he was almost fatalistic, uh, accepting defeat at this point. Uh, but he's going to stick in it and his men are, but they're going to get beat all across New York. And they're going to get beat all across the entire, uh, really the state of New Jersey. Uh, Basically, here you can see I circled New York up there. Washington's men lose constantly. They're going to force, they're going to be pushed by the British force all the way across the state of New Jersey. Uh, this is all throughout uh, September, October, November of 1776. Uh, Washington's men are deserting en masse. Uh, you know, he's losing men from battle uh, uh, casualties as well as men dying of uh, disease. Uh, Washington's army that was about 23,000 men in August of 76, by the time his men get across to down to Trenton, you can see it circled down there in the middle of your screen, by the time his men get there, uh, he counts only about 3,000 active soldiers left out of 23,000. Uh, so his army has been just decimated. Uh, and the British are just marching across the state of New Jersey. Uh, now you can see all these little uh, red squares. Those are marking some of these different outposts 
that the British are going to start uh, stationing soldiers at. Uh, Washington, he's at Trenton in early December 76, and he's going to cross the Delaware River. He's going to take all the boats onto the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River um, so that the British can't cross it. Um, and so you can see he uh, I put the Grand Union flag there on the Pennsylvania side. That's basically where his army is uh, in mid-December 1776. The British want to continue on and capture the capital of the young United States, uh, Philadelphia, but you know they can't get across the river. Um, they're talking about maybe waiting until the river freezes over so that they can march across, um, or just resuming the campaign in the following spring. And basically they decide they're gonna resume the campaign in the following spring. So the main British army is gonna march back across New Jersey and back into New York. Along the way, of course, many of these soldiers are committing atrocities on many of the civilians in the, the state of New Jersey. Uh, and that's going to only rally more men uh, to, that want to come join Washington's army. But frankly, Washington's army looks like pretty much a lost cause, uh, even to George Washington. George Washington, while he's on the banks of the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, he writes to his brother uh, telling him that he thinks the game is pretty near up. Uh, that's coming from Washington uh, in his personal correspondence. So you know it's, it's pretty dire. He even writes about how he trembles for Philadelphia, assuming that it's going to be uh, taken over by the British. Um, he's also writing to his uh, overseer at Mount Vernon, his home here in Virginia. Uh, and he's telling him to get things ready uh, to prepare to, to move out west because he's pretty sure that once this happens, he doesn't know what his status is going to be. He might be captured himself. Uh, but he wants to make sure his wife and uh, the family is able to get out of harm's way. So it's a pretty dire situation. Now, along this uh, retreat route, uh, there's a young author uh, who wrote a very famous book called Common Sense that rallied a lot of people to the American cause early in the war. And he saw how terrible it was for many of these soldiers. And he wrote uh, a pamphlet called The American Crisis. And he wrote some of the most stirring words saying, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. And we have this consolation that tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but the more difficult the, the fight, the more glorious uh, the triumph. Uh, so he writes these words into, in, and they become very inspirational to those few 3,000 guys who are sticking through it with Washington during this dark period in American history. It's got to be the closest uh, the nation ever came to uh, having independence totally wiped out. Uh, Philadelphia, Congress, they pack up. They leave town. Uh, they're going to leave Washington with almost dictatorial powers. They say, you can go ahead and raise an army that's loyal to yourself. Do whatever you need to do. Uh, to try and maintain the independence of the country because it doesn't look very good. Uh, so Washington's over here in Pennsylvania trying to decide what he's going to do. And even worse, of those 3,000 guys that are left, most of their enlistments expire on December 31st uh, at the end of the year. Uh, so he's going to lose the core of his army. So Washington's in probably the toughest situation. So what's he going to do? This is a little map that's in the book that shows you what this area looks like. Like I said, this is one of the darkest moments of American history. What's there today? So you can see it's kind of been built up much of the area around this, uh, along the Delaware River between New Jersey and Pennsylvania outside of Trenton. But when you go there, you can actually see some of the places Washington actually was. For instance, right across the river from Trenton, it's one of the headquarters buildings that Washington stayed in. It's been preserved. Uh, it's only open, I think, like one day a, a month. Obviously not right now because of COVID. Uh, but uh, that's an actual building that Washington, when he writes those words, the game is pretty near up, he's in this house. Uh, and so you can actually still see that today. Preserved by the state of Pennsylvania is this area up along the banks of the Delaware River, the graves of some of the men who died of disease that winter in December 76. It's a very moving experience to go see these graves, to think that these guys who died here, for all they knew, the cause of American independence uh, was done, and they still were willing to sacrifice their lives. Uh, it's just amazing what drove these men, what motivated them to stick uh, with this cause, even when it looked like everything was over, 
uh, is pretty inspirational to think that, that they stuck it out. And sad to think that those who died never lived to see how they would be celebrated as great heroes who uh, helped secure the independence of the country. All right, so Washington, what's he gonna do? This is the map of what the area looked like at the time. Um, you can see uh, a Trenton there in the middle. Now what Washington's gonna do, his men are, uh, you can see here, basically what the, the British do is they leave uh, a brigade of Hessians in the town of Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, now again, like I said, these are some of the, the, the most feared uh, European troops they have. Uh, they're very well trained. They fought exceptionally well in the battles around New York. Uh, Fort Washington, uh, they're going to, uh, you know, fight very well up in that area. Um, and their commander, Colonel Johann Rall, uh, is given the honor of being the closest to the enemy. Well, Rall doesn't really fear the, uh, the Americans. He thinks that they're pretty much beaten. And he had good cause to think that. Uh, and he never thought that the Americans would attempt a uh, an attack on his position, even though some of his superiors were saying, hey, you should just be uh, just in case. You should probably build some defenses. Uh, he says, let them come. He calls them country clowns. Uh, and if they come to, to, to attack us, we'll give them the bayonet. Um, so he's very uh, confident in his position there in Trenton um, and not worried about it. Uh, Washington's gonna, has his men stationed all along the banks of the Pennsylvania side. And he's gonna come up with probably the most daring move of the war. Uh, he decides he has to attack. Uh, he has really no other choice. He says, necessity, dire necessity, will, nay, must justify my attempt on the town of Trenton. He has to do something. Because like I said, his army's gonna dissolve at the end of the year. He has nothing to show for it. Um, in fact, uh, when he plans up this uh, idea to attack Trenton, he makes the password for this event, victory or death, um, which it really was. Also makes a great book title. So there you go. <laughs> but uh, so his men are, uh, what he's going to devise is a, an idea to attack the, the town of Trenton and try and capture uh, the Hessians that are stationed there. Uh, his original plan says that he's going to attack them from three different directions. Uh, he's going to cross right across from Trenton. He's going to uh, have some, they're going to fall across down river and then he will lead the main force up river. Well, on, he's, he decides he's going to do this on the night of Christmas. Um, so on Christmas night, he decides to do the attack, but what happens? A blizzard comes in, uh, and it starts snowing, and the ice starts building up on the river. Well, the uh, bottom two crossings uh, totally fail, uh, so they're not even able to get across the river. There's so much ice. Uh, so, his men, so those men are going to end up being stuck uh, so it's just George Washington and about 2,400 men. They're going to cross the Delaware River uh, on the night of December 25th, 1776. Now that moment is captured forever uh, in this image. Uh, and you all are very familiar with this, I'm sure, especially if you're in New York. Uh, you have this great uh, painting uh, that's up there in the Met. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you check it out. It is huge, uh, much larger than you would expect. Uh, beautiful painting, uh, very historically inaccurate, um, but uh, it definitely does capture the high drama of the moment. Uh, first of all, just to point out a couple of these things, like I said, it was a blizzard. Uh, so it was not this kind of where you have the sun rising in the distance. Uh, you know, they show, of course, a small boat. They would have had larger boats that they were crossing in. Washington, of course, standing up there, uh, you know, would he be standing on a small rowboat like that? I don't know. Uh, the painter, Emanuel Leutze, was actually uh, from Germany. And this river, if you go and actually visit the location, it, is, it does not look like this. Uh, this looks more like the Rhine, uh, which would make sense. Um, and uh, you see the ice, how it's forming, like little icebergs. Again, that doesn't really happen in, in that area of New Jersey. Um, but, uh, and also uh, you notice the American flag there, uh, that wasn't adopted as the American flag until the year later. Um, but you see some of these other uh, uh, figures on here, uh, you know, they do show that's James Monroe uh, holding the flag, uh, who left his studies at the College of William and Mary to go fight in the American cause. Uh, you have, uh, and he wanted to be representative. Uh, so if you look near the, uh, uh, the bow of the ship, uh, you'll see an African-American helping to row. Uh, the person rowing uh, near the stern of the ship 
uh, is kind of androgynous. So, you know, the idea was to show that women also played an important role uh, in the American cause. Uh, so even though there's inaccuracies in this moment, it really shows you the small band of people going up with the wind in their faces uh, really kind of gets across that moment. But yeah, Washington had his, uh, was up against the wall. Um, and uh, so this was his, sort of his last ditch moment to try and try and save the revolution. So Washington gets across the river uh, and then he has a nine mile march uh, to attack the town of Trenton. Uh, it's amazing too, these guys. Uh, they, you know, many of them didn't have shoes. Uh, many of the soldiers talk about how they could, you know, follow the, the army's footprints uh, from the blood in the snow, uh, which again, you know, what is, you know, a lot of what's connecting them to this cause is the men around them uh, and their leader, Washington, by their side their entire time. Washington thinks about turning around at one point, but again, you know, he, he does that option is pretty much off the table. So he pushes his men forward. Uh, they, you know, as you see here, they go down the, the Bear Tavern Road. Now what's here today? Uh, if you go, the site, like I said, is preserved by the states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, where he crossed. You can go down there, this little image in the circle you can see has the, the marker where Washington uh, crossed the Delaware River. Um, on the New Jersey side, you can still see remnants of the old road that the, the men trudged up as they were going uh, towards the town. And finally, they make it into the town. Uh, and Washington, you can see here how they enter the town from multiple sides. Uh, the blue guys, of course, are the Americans. The red are the Hessians. Now, there's a typical story that the Hessians were so drunk from Christmas that they couldn't uh, effectually put up a, a fight. Uh, that's a myth. Uh, that wasn't, wasn't true. Uh, they were actually exhausted because uh, there were little bands of American militia that had been, uh, you know, attacking their sites uh, uh, pretty continuously. So they were constantly re replying to alarms. Uh, so, you know, they were all, you know, sleeping with their weapons. They were ready to go basically at a moment's notice. And as soon as that notice came, they, you know, quickly got together uh, and they pushed back and fought against uh, uh, Washington's men. But Washington's men pretty much overwhelmed them in this snowstorm. Uh, and they come on them pretty quickly and they're firing into them. Uh, they also brought a lot of artillery with them uh, in the cannons uh, under the command of Colonel Henry Knox. And they just are firing down the streets of Trenton, um, wounding and killing many Hessians. Uh, and the Hessians are pushed out. Uh, the Hessians are going to do a couple counterattacks, but eventually, at one point, Colonel Rawl is uh, actually wounded, uh, mortally so, so he will pass away in the next couple days. Um, but uh, they eventually strike their colors in the, the Hessian surrender to the Americans. And uh, if you go to the site today in Trenton, uh, now what's nice is that the street uh, landscape actually pretty much follows the modern one. Um, there is a large monument today that marks the location where the Americans initially captured the high ground where they could fire down on the streets. Who was one of the guys commanding the cannon there? Alexander Hamilton, right? You guys know him. Uh, and uh, he's going to be firing down the streets there. But the, the monument's a, a good uh, um, representative of the importance of this victory here. You can see Washington at the top of, the, of that monument. Um, today, uh, down here, like I said, there is one city museum that does interpret the, uh, the battles of Trenton and Princeton, and that is the old barracks museum in Trenton, New Jersey. If you never checked it out, definitely recommend it. Um, and they actually have, you know, even older history going back to the French and Indian War, but it's a great site that actually can tell that story. Uh, throughout the city, though, there, you know, uh, for instance, the location of Rawls headquarters is today the site of a church, um, but they do have a plaque up on there saying that was the location uh, where he was, uh, uh, where his headquarters were. And other places, like I said, that you'll find in the book that you don't really know about. For instance, you'll see this little uh, uh, strip of land here. You can see the, the battle monument in the distance. This is a little area on King Street where the Hessians put up a really tough fight. It was probably some of the heaviest fighting of the Battle of Trenton happened right where that pavement is, you see right there. And at one point, uh, there was a, a Hessian cannon there and uh, Washington rides up and says, you know, order some of the men to capture the cannon. And who runs down there? A young 18 year old James Monroe uh, and the Hessians fire into them and a musket ball is gonna actually hit James Monroe in the shoulder, uh, knocks him to the ground uh, and he starts to bleed out. 
Um, and luckily a doctor was there is able to, to clamp his artery and save his life. Uh, but the future fifth president of the United States almost died uh, right there uh, on the street in Trent. But there is no marker, no plaque, uh, no wayside. So uh, it's one of those things that, you know, history happened there, but a lot of people don't even realize it. And this is a glorified image also by John Trumbull of the uh, surrender of Colonel Rawl. So you see him there uh, wounded, being helped over to Washington so he could surrender his sword. Uh, if you look just behind Colonel Rawl, uh, you will see a young wounded James Monroe there on the ground. Um, but again, this is kind of an idealized uh, portrait, uh, but still gets across the momentous event of this was. Uh, during this battle, it's amazing because there were a couple Americans who were wounded, but there were none killed. Uh, the only one who died, there's only two that died and they died uh, freezing to death on the march to Trenton. Uh, the Hessians on the other side, uh, they had about a hundred that were killed and wounded and over 900 are gonna surrender to the Americans and are made prisoners of war. Uh, this was a huge lightning shock. It went up and down the East Coast. The Americans have finally won one um and uh and and it was a huge morale boost uh immediate uh, washington it doesn't savor his victory in trenton he actually moves his men back over onto the pennsylvania side with their prisoners uh but during the next week he's going to move back to trenton um and while he's in trenton there are just influxes of more militia and more reinforcements coming to help support him uh people who now all of a sudden you know as in anything in life i guess if you're winning people want to jump onto the bandwagon. So a lot of people started jumping on. Um, but some of Washington's men, like I said, the core of his army, those 3,000 guys who stuck it out all around, like I said, their enlistments expired on December 31st. Uh, well, the day was approaching, it was New Year's Eve, and some of his men were packing up and getting ready to go home. And Washington offered, he was able to, to, to work with uh, Robert Morris down in Philadelphia. He's able to get enough money that he's able to offer $10 uh, to any man who will stick on for just six more weeks, uh, which was a big deal. And uh, not a lot of them took it. And then Washington began to uh, have his generals go out and give speeches to try and get them to stay on. And Washington usually didn't give speeches to his troops, but on this occasion he did. He's going to form up his men in Trenton. He's going to ride in front of them, uh, and he's going to give an impassioned speech to them. Uh, and he's going to say, uh, you know, your friends, your family, all that you hold dear is at stake. We know not how to spare you. If you will consent to just six more weeks, you will render that service to your country and to your homes that you can probably never do under any other circumstances. Uh, and it was a, a really impassioned speech he gave to his men. And, uh, and after he gave that, men started stepping forward. Uh, and he was able to hold on. Some of them are gonna go home, but he's able to hold on to the core of those men. Well, the British are absolutely outraged that this happened. And almost immediately, they start spreading rumors of they were drunk. That's why the Americans won. Uh, and it becomes this, you know, how can we scapegoat this? This was a fluke. This should not have happened. Uh, in fact, uh, General Cornwallis of the British Army, he was getting ready to go home uh, and go back to, uh, go back to England uh, when this happened. He's immediately going to cancel his leave. Uh, he's going to gather every British redcoat in New York he can find, and they're going to start marching immediately down to crush Washington and his upstarts there in Trenton. All right, and this is, shows you the map. As they start marching down the Trenton-Princeton Road, uh, he's going to leave uh, a few thousand guys back at Princeton, New Jersey. He's going to march the main army down to attack Washington, who, as you can see in this map, he lines up most of his men behind the Assunpink Creek. Uh, as a defensive position, but he puts out some men along the road to try and slow down the British. And all day on January 2nd, 1777, the Americans are going to fight the British all at every stream and crossing that uh, they can. They're going to fire on this massive British column that starts marching towards them. This is known as the Second Battle of Trenton or the Battle of Aston Pink Creek. But all throughout the day on January 2nd, there's this fighting going on. Finally, the British get down to the town of Trenton and they charge into the town of Trenton. Now it's right about four or five o'clock in the evening, which in the winter, it's getting very, very dark. Uh, all of Washington's men get across the Aston Pink Creek, and then uh, Cornwallis is gonna launch three different assaults uh, trying to get to Washington. 
uh, and they're all going to meet bloody repulses. Uh, the Americans hold off the British uh, as it starts getting dark. And uh, the British have to decide, and Cornwallis says, we'll bag the old fox in the morning. Uh, and so the idea is that they'll wait around that night, and early next morning, they'll assault and take Washington's position. Uh, Washington, at this point, he has many more men in his army, but a lot of them are brand new, uh, and uh, he's still outnumbered by the British. So what's he going to do? Uh, first of all, if you go to these sites today, a lot of them you'll find are marked uh, by different localities uh, that have little markers. So you can actually stand at these different creeks where they put up fights. Uh, but probably one of the most important sites uh, is this location, uh, which is uh, the Douglas House. Uh, it was in this house that Washington had a council of war on the night of January 2nd, 1777. What's he going to do? Uh, he has a couple options. He could stand and fight, but if he gets, if he gets beat here, he has the Delaware River on his back. Uh, he could easily get crushed, and he could himself be killed or captured. He could retreat, but then he could go back to Philadelphia, but then he'll look like uh, that this entire thing was exactly what the British said, a fluke. And that's when he comes up with a daring, probably even more daring than crossing the Delaware River. Okay, he's going to decide instead to disengage and march around the flank of the British Army. And here you can see a map of that. Washington could disengage, and this is what he's going to do on around midnight. Uh, he's going to build up his fires where his campfires were and make it look like he's sitting there getting ready to fight. Uh, and he's going to move all his men out. They're going to march silently, and they have to be very quiet. They actually wrap the, you know, the, the cannon wheels, the carriages wheels with uh, cloth. Um, and, uh, you know, it was ordered that all the men were to be silent. Anybody who, who made any noise were to be bayoneted. Um, so it was, it was meant that there was to be no noise because they had to be as silent as possible because as soon as if they were caught in the middle of the night they could have been cut up by the british so they're going to march around the british flank uh and this is a a, a, dis, a long distance they're going to do um of uh of about 10 miles uh and they're going to march all the way around the british flank and you can see they go all the way up and they're going to meet the british whatever the rear guard is there up in princeton um, and you can see along the way, uh, the Sons of the Revolution uh, in New Jersey uh, actually had marked, there's about 11 of these markers showing you the route of that uh, famous flank march that Washington did. And they're going to come up to uh, the town of Princeton. They get just south of the town of Princeton when all of a sudden they realize that the British there were actually marching to go join Cornwallis. They turn around uh, and they engage each other out in the fields just south of Princeton. Uh, now, the Americans are first initially pushed back, um, and uh, they start retreating in disarray. Um, and you can see here, uh, there was a, a farm there, Thomas Clark, and his house still stands there today. It's been added on over the years, but that's what it looked like. Um, and as the men, they start running back to this house behind it, and they start hiding out there. Uh, and the British look like they're going to win a great victory and defeat the Americans. And that's when Washington comes riding up into the middle of the fighting and starts rallying the troops. Uh, he also brought with him some fresh reinforcements. Uh, he starts riding up and down the lines saying, parade with me, my brave fellows. There's but a handful of the enemy and we shall have them directly. Uh, and he was right. They outnumbered the British vastly. Uh, but, you know, the fear that pervaded was calmed by Washington's riding among his men and also by a couple American artillery pieces uh, Mulder's Battery. Uh, and like I said, here today, now this battlefield is preserved by the state of New Jersey, um, at least the large parts of it. And uh, here was the location of where the battery is. And you can see today this open plain that, that sits there in front of them. Uh, and the battery held off the British for a little while until the Americans were able to rally up. And then Washington himself, riding at the head of his troops, rides right out into the middle of this field gets within 30 yards of the British Army. He's in between the American and British armies. They both level their muskets and they all fire at the same time. His aide, uh, Colonel John Fitzgerald, said he covered his hat over his eyes because he didn't want to see Washington cut down in front of him. Uh, but after the volleys pass, he lifts his hat up and the smoke clears and there's Washington, completely unscathed. Uh, <laughs> is uh, probably one of the most amazing moments. There was one of his soldiers there that saw this happen he writes to his wife the next day, he said, when I saw Washington bear all the dangers of the field with his important life hanging as it were by a single hair with a thousand deaths flying around him, 
believe me, I thought not of myself. And he was able to rally the men around him. And they were, right after those volleys, he ordered charge and the Americans charge forward their bayonets uh, and drive the British off the field. They, they break them and, and, and the 17th Regiment of Foot that was uh, posing them break and run in front of them. Uh, and this is a first for Washington, a uh, battlefield victory against redcoat soldiers uh, right there on that field you see there. Uh, just absolutely amazing. Um, here you can see uh, another glorified painting of this moment uh, by John Trumbull. Uh, there you see in the center at the top, Washington rallying the troops in that iconic moment. Just near the feet of his horse, you'll see his, uh, one of his uh, soldiers, uh, Hugh Mercer, uh, who's a general, who was actually killed. Uh, he was bayoneted seven times on that field. And there's a lot of brutal uh, bayonet action that happened on the field at Princeton. Uh, there was one Virginian who was bayoneted 13 times uh, and lingered for multiple days afterwards before he finally died. Um, but uh, the Americans were victorious at Princeton. They drive the British off the field and then immediately they go towards Morristown, New Jersey, uh, where they're gonna set up winter quarters. Uh, Cornwallis, who is waiting to attack the Americans down at Assunpink Creek, he hears the cannon fire of the Battle of Princeton in his rear, immediately turns all soldiers to go back up there, uh, only to find by the time they got there, the Americans had left. Uh, so it, it was amazing. And basically where Washington was positioned in Morristown, New Jersey, he was astride the, uh, the British supply lines. Uh, so during that time, the, the, you know, the British, that whole, all those outposts they had, they couldn't hold any of them. So they pull all of their army out of New Jersey. They bring them all back to New York. Uh, and in the course of 10 days, George Washington had turned the entire American Revolution on its head. What at one point looked like a complete and utter disaster uh, for the, uh, the American cause. And 10 days later, all of a sudden, people are start lining up to join the American cause because now they actually have an idea that they can win it. And historians for the past, 250 years have uh, pretty much agreed that this, these, uh, these 10 days changed the course of American history. Uh, without it, you would not have a independent America as the way uh, that happened in the years that followed. Uh, today, when you go to the site, um, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of it's not uh, preserved, but they do, like I said, every year they do an annual reenactment of the actual uh, Battle of Trenton, uh, which is a great event. If you've never been, I definitely recommend it. Uh, here you can see reenactors marching. Uh, if you look down there at the bottom, second from the right, you'll see myself uh, marching along uh, with the troops there. Uh, I was able to do it a couple years ago, but it's a great way to actually preserve the memory of the guys who fought and died there. Um, like I said, Trenton will go on to be remembered as, you know, even Civil War historians like James McPherson writes uh, in his forward for uh, Washington's Crossing by David Hackett Fisher that this was the seminal moment uh, in American history. There's no more important moment in American history. Uh, so that's one of the reasons, like I said, you know, I wanted to write this. There's even a historian who wrote uh, a British historian. I think he summed it up best. And I included in my book too that, uh, you, you know, he writes, uh, it may be doubted whether so small a number of men ever employed so short a space of time with greater or more lasting results upon the history of the world. Uh, now that's a that's a big statement, but uh, you know I've yet to see anybody be able to uh, to counter that claim because uh, and there's a reason why they call it the ten crucial days, um, and they, they really were crucial. And the amount of personalities and people who are involved in this, you have George Washington. James Monroe, you have Alexander Hamilton, you have uh, Henry Knox, you have all these, these major figures who are going to play important roles later on in the, the creation of the United States uh, that also took part in this. It, it's, it's really an amazing story. Um, but with that, uh, yeah, that's just about 45 minutes there. So uh, I'll stop my uh, sharing here. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the presentation and, and learned a little bit about the battles. Like I said, I could go on and on uh, about these, uh, the battles and, and the 10 crucial days, but I definitely recommend if you get a chance to, to get the book, because like I said, it, it not only, you know, tells a lot of these stories, but it, it shows you exactly where they happen. So if you ever get a chance, hopefully after COVID, uh, to do some traveling and to go visit some of these sites, 
uh, uh, it makes uh, for a great uh, way to learn history in the actual place where the history happened. Great, thank you so much, Mark. That was really, really interesting. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Mary, who is going to moderate our Q&A. So remember, if you have a question, just drop it into the chat for her to see. All right, uh, thank you for putting in that photo of you as a reenactor, because that was my first question that I had to of, what do you reenact? So <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always very curious when those things happen. Uh, Jenny Davis asks for the first question. I know that Washington goes through Trenton as president elect on his route from Mount Vernon to New York City to be inaugurated. Does he ever return to Princeton or to the points of the Delaware River crossing on either side? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, <laughs> you're correct. Yeah, uh, he does go through Trenton and there is a marker too on the Aston Pink Bridge, wh wh what's there today uh, for that exact event. And he writes about that, yeah, stopping, and he's greeted by all these people from the town uh, uh, who greet him as a hero, and they even have a big banner that says, uh, uh, you know, the defenders of, uh, of the women of Trenton, something along those lines. And Washington writes a very nice note where he thinks about, and Washington doesn't get very sentimental, but he gets kind of sentimental thinking about what it was like when he was on the south side of the Aston Pink Bridge during the battle, during the second battle of Trenton, and uh, to think about how, how close he was to defeat, and then to think about where he was now going to be inaugurated as President of the United States. Um, but as far as going back to the actual McConkie's Ferry, where the, where the crossing took place, or Princeton, uh, you know, I don't know about the, the crossing. I would think he probably went through Princeton on his way. Well, I know he definitely goes through it on his way back, uh, uh, back and forth, because he also goes through Trenton and Princeton, because that was right along the main road, which today is Route 1, but uh, it was along that main road that he's going when he goes down to Yorktown, the Battle of Yorktown, and then also when he's going up to be uh, President of New York. So I think he did go to Princeton, um, but... Uh, 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 but two very completely different moods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I, I don't know of him uh, writing about going to look at the battlefield again. Uh, in Washington, like I said, the, the time that he goes through Trenton is probably the most sentimental he gets. He doesn't really, you know, talk much uh, after the war about uh, these battles and things like that. And his, uh, his, his uh, step-grandson was George Washington Park Custis, uh, who writes this great memoirs about what it was like, because he grew up with Washington at Mount Vernon. And he writes about, uh, uh, you know, how Washington sometimes seemed distant or his, uh, uh, you know, it seemed as if he was transported to a different time or place. Maybe he had some sort of, uh, you know, uh, recurring images of what was happening during those days. I'm sure it left some sort of uh, mental or spiritual scar on him, if not, uh, since he did, wasn't physically scarred. But, uh, but yeah, no, as far as going to visit the crossing site again or Princeton, I don't think he uh, ever did, at least to go sightseeing, so to speak. So, <laughs> uh, Ken Myers asks, why didn't Washington stay at Trenton after the battle? What were the reasons the other two forces of Washington did not or could not cross the Delaware? Who were their commanders? Okay, uh, so you had uh, Colonel Ewing uh, was commanding the, uh, um, uh, some of the, and most of the other soldiers that were trying to cross to those two other places, most of them were militiamen. Um, and uh, they were supposed to cross, uh, Colonel Ewing was right across from Trenton. Uh, and just below you had uh, Colonel John Codwalder, uh, who was supposed to be crossing down there. Um, both of them couldn't cross because of the ice. Uh, the ice started building up. Now, Cadwalder, some of his men were able to walk on the ice across, but they couldn't get any of their cannon or anything else like that. Uh, so they crossed over a little bit, but then they decided it was a bad idea. Again, it's in the middle of a blizzard, so they go back uh, and they write that they're, they're not able to get everybody across. Um, uh, but as far, actually, it turns out that probably was a good, uh, good reason, or it was a good thing they couldn't cross, because if Ewing's guys were able to cross right at Trenton, or Cadwalder's guys got up there, if either of them alarmed the Hessians before Washington's main force came in, they, it probably would have ruined the whole, uh, the whole attempt. Um, so uh, that was the reason why they couldn't get across. What was the other part of the question? Uh, Sorry. Who were their commanders? What were the other reasons the other two forces of Washington did not or could not cross the Delaware? Okay, I think I covered those. I think you got it. 
Yeah. Uh, going back to the Hessians and some of the best folklore of the American Revolutionary War. In the spy story turn, Washington spy can pinpoint where the Hessians are because they are buying cabbage for sauerkraut. Fantasy makes a nice anecdote. Uh, yeah, no, um, and, I mean, okay, so this is true for, for pretty much the whole 10 crucial days, uh, after, after this, I mean, this stuff becomes the stuff of legend, uh, very quickly, uh, so there are plenty and plenty of myths and stories that, that kind of rose out of these 10 days, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of source material from, like, the 1800s or whatever, they say things, uh, that we don't know is necessarily true or not. Uh, there is a very famous spy story associated with the, the Battle of Trenton with a man by the name of John Honeyman, uh, who supposedly was uh, uh, pretending to be a uh, loyalist who was captured by the Americans, but who actually would go and meet with Washington and point out all the dispositions of the Hessian army. Uh, and, uh, you know, is that true? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we do know Washington was a master spy master. Uh, he really tried to use everything in his, uh, you know, in his, uh, uh, they had at his disposal to try and get information about the enemy. Um, so it's not unlikely he had spies working for him, but in, yeah, as, as Turn had, whether it's buying cabbage or if it was this John Honeyman, uh, we don't really know, but it's likely there were some spies uh, that were helping Washington at some point, so. Awesome. Uh, Jackie asks, there seems to be a lot of idealized artistic renderings of the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Which paintings do you think are the most historically accurate? Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, they are idealized and romanticized <laughs> uh, for good reason, I think. Uh, um, but, uh, but as far as like a historically accurate version, uh, Don Troiani is a modern artist uh, who does some great paintings. Uh, and he has a, a few good ones, one of the actual Battle of Rawl being wounded, uh, and one of uh, Washington's men marching on the road towards Trenton. Uh, I think those are pretty good. You can probably Google Don Troiani and Battle of Trenton or, or Battle of Princeton. He also has one of Washington leading his men at the forefront. One thing any painting does, though, it, while it may be historically accurate, it might not really capture, you know, how terrible some of this stuff was. Uh, like I said, the, the battles of Princeton, they said that uh, because of the ice on the ground, that men who were being shot and killed, uh, their blood was pooling on the ice. Um, so some of this, uh, uh, you know, how terrible war is, I don't know if you can necessarily get across in a, in a painting that you want to hang in your house. Um, but, uh, but as far as, you know, the, the positions, the uniforms, uh, uh, in, in the background and stuff like that, I would definitely check out Don Troiani's work, because I think uh, some of his stuff's the best. And then right behind me, uh, you got uh, uh, Charles McBaron's painting, uh, which I feature on the cover of the book. Um, and that is uh, uh, a, a pretty accurate, again, uh, a drawing of that charge down King Street to get that artillery piece. Um, and that was done around the bicentennial in 1976. And I think it's a, a, a pretty good rendering of the Battle of Trenton as well. Uh, Ed asks, where did Washington send or uh, send all of the imprisoned soldiers that he caught from the British, all 900 of them? Oh, good question. Uh, well, at first they're, 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 they, they move them to Newtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, and interestingly, Washington actually dines uh, with the uh, Hessian commanders, um, which we might think is odd today, but that was kind of 18th century uh, warfare rules is that you would dine with the, the fellow officers. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, and the officers in, enlisted were, were sent in different places, but they were all paraded through the streets of Philadelphia first, because people had never seen <laughs> sections before. So this is their first opportunity to, to see what uh, they had heard so many stories about. Uh, and then they were sent to uh, prisoner of war camps, uh, and they had some in Pennsylvania, some were down in Virginia. Um, but, uh, and honestly, you know, some of them were going to be exchanged back, but honestly, a lot of um, Hessians, uh, you know, there are many German American communities uh, here in Pennsylvania, in Virginia, and a lot of them are going to settle down. They're going to actually leave because uh, they don't want to go back to, to Germany. Um, and uh, thousands of them end up uh, staying in the United States, and many Americans today, if you trace your history, can find a Hessian ancestor who decided to stay here once uh, once they got here, which is interesting. I lost the question. Hold on. 
Uh, it was a good one. It was an interesting one. I apologize. I cannot find it, but I remember it said, what did you learn as a reenactor that you didn't know as a historian? Oh, uh, <laughs> a lot of the, uh, the personal aspects. Uh, Cause it's one thing to say, Washington's guys marched, you know, it's really easy. And even writing it, Washington's men marched nine miles through the snow to Trenton. Like, let's get to the action. Well, when you actually are marching nine miles in the type of shoes that they wore back then, uh, it just changes your whole perception of, wow, this is, this is amazing that, hey, people were doing this. Uh, and then I haven't done it in a blizzard yet, but I can only imagine. Um, and then also, yeah, what, 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 what they carried, what their daily life was. Uh, the fact that, you know, three or four articles that they're carrying with them, a blanket, uh, you know, the bayonet that gets really heavy after a while, the musket, which weighs 10 pounds. I mean, those kinds of things gives you a much greater appreciation for really the, uh, the common soldier's perspective on everything going on. Uh, so I find that really in invaluable when you're, when you're trying to put your, your mind into to what it was like for these soldiers. Yeah, it's definitely, when we have reenactors come to the museum, it's much different than a hired actor who just goes, oh, I'm going to read these lines and it's going to be fine. Whereas, you know, these reenactors, I'm sure, you know, spend years doing this. Every year they have the same crew that they see at the same battle reenactments and they make their outfits by hand and they know seamstresses and they get their shoes right and they make fun of everybody's belt buckles if they're wrong. It's just a very tight-knit community of people who know all the tiny details that I would never think to know. Yes. And as you said, I mean, it is kind of, or as my mom calls it, the circus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the same, same group of people. Uh, so we all kind of know each other. Uh, but it, it's a great way to, uh, to learn. And also, like I said, and, you know, it, people are able to talk about research and stuff like that as well. So I enjoy it. Yeah. It's always good to bring 1776 back into 2020. <laughs> uh, Kathy Hamill said, uh, asked, excuse me, is there a catalog of all the Revolutionary War plaques and monuments in New Jersey? Is there a database that we can go visit, possibly? Um, there is, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know of any, uh, a full database that has every single one. Um, there is a uh, Revolutionary War in New Jersey. Um, uh, there's a website out there. I'd have to Google it, but uh, uh, that has many of these sites on there. Um, but as far as every single plaque, I I'm not sure of, uh, uh, and yeah, uh, Crossroads of the American Revolution is, uh, is a great group out there that's, that's working to preserve some of these sites and also, yeah, to put waysides and markers out there to mark some of the places that haven't been marked as well. Uh, Ambrose asks, what was the role of Colonel Glover? Uh, Colonel Glover, he played a really important role. Uh, he was uh, uh, in a Massachusetts regiment. Uh, his men were from Marblehead, Massachusetts, and they were seafarers um, and fishermen. Uh, and they were the ones that are going to row Washington's guys across the East River uh, in August of 1776 and saved his army then. Uh, and when they had to cross the Delaware River in December 76, they're going to be tasked with, uh, with getting everybody across. And they do it with expert skill uh, in, you know, this very trying time. Uh, and it was supposed to be done. Obviously, the, the snowstorm made it much longer. But him and his men are going to be the, the, uh, extremely important in getting everybody across the river. And as soon as they get everybody across the river, then they join in with the main army and join in the attack on Trenton. So uh, they're memorialized. There's a statue of one of his uh, men uh, down there at the Battle Monument in Trenton. All right. Uh, the last question is a lighthearted one. Uh, if you could have dinner with anybody at Francis Tavern, who would it be? Huh, that's an easy one. George Washington. <laughs> 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 that's I mean, fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was, uh, I mean, he's having experienced all this. I mean, I would probably want to talk his ear off about Trenton and Princeton, but, you know, like I said, he, he usually didn't talk about that stuff. Um, but as far as any of, uh, the junior officers, uh, or the other officers that were there under him, I mean, I would have to say, I mean, Henry Knox, uh, I would guess, uh, being that he was in command of the artillery there. I mean, just his amazing story. If you haven't heard about how he moved all the artillery from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston, uh, 
that's an amazing story. And that's one uh, of my favorites. Yeah, I think he's he probably has just as many interesting stories. Uh, uh, and he seemed like a, a pretty uh, jolly fellow who liked a, a good good company. So I, w- I would say Henry Knox. That's a solid crew. It sounds like you might be one of the officers from the farewell. <laughs> Just like hiding in the background. It's yeah. like a nice fly I'd on the wall. Weeping for sure. I'd be one of those weeping, uh, watching, thinking it'd be the last time you see Washington after that long struggle. So um, absolutely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their evening to come uh, listen to me talk about something I really care about. Uh, like I said, uh, check us out, Emerging Revolutionary War, and the, uh, the book is Victory or Death Battle Trends in Princeton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for moderating our Q&A, and thank you, Mark, for great answers and a great presentation. Uh, And finally, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening at another Francis Tavern Museum virtual lecture. Thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. These donations help us continue keeping our programming going even though we can't be physically in the building. Um, If you would like to donate, you can visit our website, francistavernmuseum.org. This is also where you can sign up for our mailing list or find all of our social media information so you can stay on top of our upcoming programming. We recently added another special lecture for August on August 20th. Uh, so if you're interested in that, visit our website. Otherwise, uh, thank you for being here. We hope to see you soon virtually and hopefully soon we can welcome you all back in person. Have a great evening, everybody.